thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own, into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps and Peepers, episode 13. An especially scary number. Lindsay's scared. I'm Dan. <laughs> I just keep staring at you with a weird <laughs> face. Hi, I'm Lindsay. Hi. You 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 saw me prepping uh, this week's stories. You know that I, I was like, ooh, yeah, scary. La- yeah, last night I was, uh, you were upstairs in the mm-hmm. kitchen and I was... Doing some stuff in the garage, just like prepping for a uh, live podcast in Tacoma this weekend for um, Time Suck, our Dan's other podcast. And I came back in at one point. He was like, I was going to come check on you. I was so scared in here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it exactly like that. But I was going to come. Yeah, I was getting, I was weird myself out a little bit. What, what doesn't help is the chair I like to sit in when I'm at home just because it's, uh, I don't know, better variety than I guess the other places I write. Yeah. It's a very comfortable chair, easy to type on. And it's a swivel chair. And it, if I look to my right, I look straight down the stairs to a huge mirror. And then that mirror, the angle I'm sitting at, cuts back down some other, into the very dark basement. And so when your mind starts playing tricks on you, it's like, oh, don't look to the right. Don't look to the right. And uh, yeah, I was, I was getting some serious chills on one of the stories uh, wow. put together this week. Great. That sounds fun. So thanks to, to all of me. you. <laughs> thanks to all of you who've been watching, who've been spreading the word, uh, giving us ratings. Uh, we, we continue to get re- ratings and reviews, which keeps us in the charts on iTunes and other places and helps us find new creeps and peepers. And we are very grateful. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And YouTube, you. YouTube co-watching is growing. So we're excited that more people are checking this uh, show out on YouTube. I, I do think it's a fun visual show to watch. Uh, we kind of set it up that way. So thanks for doing that to those of you who have that option. I know not everybody can do that. Right. Some people their, are at work. Mm-hmm, yeah. We get it. We get it. So, we, so we're trying to make it lean too hard that way. Right. But it's, it's a fun little extra thing if you get to watch it. It might be super fun if one day I really lose it and I just start crying. Maybe. Maybe that'll be today. Oh, God. Sweet. <laughs> Thanks, uh, honey. You're so thoughtful. <laughs> <laughs> looking forward to telling my two stories today and looking forward to hearing some uh, of your stories that you've sent in to the My Story at Scared to Death podcast.com email. Some true horror that Lindsay put together to tell me this week. I know. The tough part is, is that we had that really intense story a mm-hmm. few weeks ago. And every time I sit down to do it, I'm like, okay, what scary thing am I going to find this week? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and, and I will say to like to listeners, don't be intimidated by that story in particular right. because you know, like when I'm putting stories, you know, together as well, yeah, they vary. And, mm-hmm. and and some some stories are just really creepy, really scary right away, but maybe don't linger for some reason later on. Mm-hmm. Other stories don't seem as obviously scary right away, but then hit you a few days later. Those are the ones that get me. Mm-hmm. The ones that kind of, a few days later, you'll be doing something. You're like, oh, yeah. Our fr- I, oh, no. Our first story might be like that today. We have, we, have a, we have a little baby story and then a longer story. Yeah, two stories. Couple spooky tales. The first takes us to Australia in 1978, and I, and I think it touches on what you specifically get scared about more than myself. Which is that Australia is not real. <laughs> Australia is not real. Uh, that's such a weird conspiracy that is out there. I do um, love saying that every time someone says Australia. It's just not, not real it's actors. My favorite thing. Well, that's crisis actors. Um, no, what is it about Australia and UFOs? Our first UFO oh. tale also took place in Australia from either the first episode or the second episode. Uh, this story is not an abduction like that one was. It's a sighting followed by a disappearance. <sighs> what happened to Frederick? Valentich. I really hate when people disappear. This is a really creepy disappearance story. Was it just, I, I get the order messed up, so forgive me, but was it just last week that we were in Maine in the forest? And that was like two weeks ago. I believe, yeah, Vermont, and, and I believe it was two weeks ago, yes. See mm-hmm. how I block it out of my mind? That's the only way I get through this, is I'm like, <laughs> okay, that didn't happen, it's not real. Dan did not tell me those stories this week. Uh, our second story takes us to a haunted house in a small town in Kentucky in the 80s. This is the one that was really giving me the chills. Oh. Okay. Uh, where a 10-year-old girl and her mom claim to have been terrorized by some you know, very uncomfortable poltergeist activity. I already got the chills because Monroe's 11. So I was just mm-hmm. thinking like, uh, little kid. Yep. This is a little kid uh, story for sure. Uh, are you are you ready? Let me know 
when you are ready, Lindsay, to be scared to death. I got my fuzzies on. You got your fuzzies on? Okay, you got yeah. your... I, these are what um, animal raccoons. Are those? <laughs> raccoons? You got some, some raccoon protection socks. All right. I don't know if the raccoon is a known protective spirit animal of any well, sort. Well, they're fierce and scrappy, and they'll tear you apart. Are they? They're sneaky. Yeah, and aggressive. Okay. They're aggressive. Okay. All right. Fine. If yeah, that, they'll uh, fucking tear your eyeballs out. Try, fine. Uh, yeah, we all know that <laughs> raccoons regularly tear people's eyeballs out. So that, okay. Dude. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop. Don't mock my protection. All right. Did you um, spray protection spray all over yourself? No, I did not. Did you close your eyes and imagine a white or golden light en nope. encompassing you? Nope. So you know who's going to get fucked by the demons? Oh, me? Yep. All and right. you're not going to like it. Oh, I'll have good stories about it. It's not the kind you like. I do this. <sighs> okay. Spray in some kind of some kind of demon spray. Fair enough. Well, Lindsay's uh, getting getting prepped. She's getting into her happy place that I will then try to destroy. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm protected. <laughs> okay, you okay. can't even you can't even scare me. I dare you to try. Time now for the tale of the possible alien abduction of Frederick Valentich. 1978, 20 year old pilot named Frederick Valentich disappeared forever. Frederick had been attempting a training flight over the Bass Strait that lies between the Australian mainland and Tasmania. He was flying a Cessna 182L. He was a moderately experienced pilot, having already clocked roughly 150 hours of flying time. And on the night of October 21st, 1978, Frederick departed for a training flight from Moorabbin on King Island, a 125-mile journey over the Bass Strait. Uh, Moorabbin, I think it's actually how you say it. And at 7.06 p.m., Frederick radioed the Melbourne Flight Service to report that an unidentified aircraft was following him at an altitude of 4,500 feet. The service told him they were not able to identify any traffic near him as he's reporting this. Oh. Frederick insists that he can see a large unknown aircraft flying near him. He said it appears to have four bright illuminated landing lights. He claims it had just passed a thousand feet above him, moving at a very high speed. For the next five minutes, Frederick continued to report the movements of this unidentified aircraft that was not showing up on any air traffic control instrumentation. Weird. He claimed it had moved towards him numerous times, that he thought the other pilot was toying with him. He claimed at one point it was orbiting above him. The only description besides the four landing lights that Frederick was able to give was the aircraft's exterior was a shiny and metallic surface, had a green light on it, and then not more than five minutes after first radioing the Melbourne Flight Service, Valentich reports he's having some sort of engine trouble. Oh, shit. And then the radio officials ask him once more to identify the other aircraft. He manages to respond, it isn't an aircraft, right before his transmission cuts out. The last sound the radio officials hear is a metallic scraping sound. And then no one ever hears from Frederick Valentich again. Radio officials at the Melbourne Flight Service assumed that Frederick, of course, had crashed. An initial sea and air search of the area, though, uh, he was flying in, turns up nothing. Nothing. The Australian Department of Transport also looks into Frederick's disappearance, and they're unable to find anything. In the end, his disappearance is presumed fatal, and his case is closed. After his mysterious disappearance, the public learns from Fred's father, Guido Valentich, that Frederick was an ardent believer, quote unquote, in UFOs and that he was worried about being attacked by one. Did he have some sort of premonition? Ufologists jumped on this case immediately, and some of them claim there were other eyewitnesses or other eyewitness accounts of the green lights that Valentich reported seeing moving across the sky in the area where he was flying on the night he disappeared. Oh, dear. A UFO action group in Victoria even claimed that an unidentified farmer saw a 30-meter-long aircraft hovering over his farm the morning after Valentich went missing, a craft whose appearance matched the description Frederick Valentich had given the Melbourne Flight Service the night he vanished. Ugh. Did UFOs crash Frederick's plane? Did they take it? If so, where is he now? <sighs> Isn't that a weird one? I don't like it. He's worried about UFOs. But if Australia's not real, it didn't happen. <laughs> I need some justification here so I can forget about it. But isn't that strange? He's worried about UFOs, according to his dad. You know, he he goes and like he talks to air traffic control for five minutes. Right. Th and there then was just... this thing harassing me. 
Then he has some kind of, you know, unknown engine trouble. You know, obviously uh, he had done maintenance checks before. I mean, mm-hmm. those things happen well, sure. all the time, but it's just weird timing that all of a sudden he has this engine trouble while this uh, supposed unidentified object. I mean, I don't know why he would be making that up. I mean, I guess he could, but still it's very strange that he then disappears and then they find no trace of his plane. Well, that's the thing. Even if he was making the whole thing up, even if he right. was just like kind of like fucking with air traffic control and was um, feeding into his own fear or desire for this to be real. Yeah. For him to just be completely gone. Right. That doesn't make sense. Right. With no proof, no busted plane, no plane in the side of a mountain, no fire and carnage, just fucking nothing. Right. And what year was this? 1978. And how, do we know how old he was at the time? Like in his uh, 20s, I, I, 30s? I did, uh, yeah, I mean, just, well, you know, actually, uh, let's get a picture of him up here. Because this is a picture of him. Okay, so a young man. Young man, young man. I believe he was in his late 20s, but I I am i don't have that in my notes. Because what I'm thinking is that if if he staged this whole thing somehow, oh, right. he, it's not like he would be 90 right now. Like, he would be walking around somewhere. He would be alive somewhere. Yeah, and, and yeah, exactly. And, and state, I mean, he did disappear, I believe, off the instrumentation, you know, like like, like he... He did, no one's really doubting that he went away, that he wrecked. Like, no one thinks that he um, escaped. I'll show you, the, the next picture is actually a map of the area. Um, okay. You can oh, see, yeah. you know, he's, he's flying out over the ocean. Yes, there's this tiny little island, but you would think. Is he that red? He That's the flight path. Pattern? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's the flight path. And if you look at the top of the picture, that's the uh, Moorabbin, uh, you know, a- a- airport he left from. And okay. then he was going okay. over to that little island. I can't quite see this far. I think it's King Island is what's written there on the map. Yeah, that's and, what it says. Okay, and then he, yeah, and that's where he disappears. Okay, so Melbourne. And that's Tasmania Robin, down there da, da, below, da, da. down okay. there in South Australia. On a lighter note, do you remember the cartoon Tasmanian Devil? Come oh, yeah, to of Tasmania, course, of course. come to Tasmania. I don't remember that being said on that. I remember him just spinning around and, rah, 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 and that like, eat stuff. That was his theme song. Did he have a theme song? Yes, at the beginning of the show. Did he have his come- own show? Come to Tasmania, come to Tasmania. <laughs> I don't remember that. I just remember him appearing in little like quick cartoons with like Bugs Bunny and those people and tearing stuff up. I feel like I can't trust you. I can't trust a person who has a Tasmanian devil tattooed on themselves. Oh, uh, well, let's not go there. Because um, <laughs> I've seen I've seen that. Not, okay, not that you can't be, you know, happy I around. know, whatever. Oh, and a couple more pictures. Uh, yeah, this story is starting to sink in because now I'm like, what if we were like, okay, we're getting mm. on a plane on Thursday. Right. We're going Fly to Tacoma. Time. Like, right. We're on planes all the time. So that yeah. kind of stuff. I mean, has a huge aircraft ever gone missing? Yeah, the Malaysian flight. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I believe yeah. they, they found um, parts of that, though. I, it's been a while since I've thought about that story, but I'm I pretty sure. About, I forgot all the details of that. Yeah, that one vanished, but then I'm 99.99% sure that they have uh, found parts of that plane that are like washed up on various what shores. About people. I don't Did think all they, the people I don't go missing th- and yes. how many? Quite a few. Wait, so that's my thing. Like a so. lot. And I don't think they ever found their remains or anything, to my recollection in this moment. Yeah, we might be wrong. Yeah. But then just like that thought freaks me out because I'm like, oh my God, like we get on planes every other week. Yeah. What if, what if something just took over our plane? Right. Maybe, maybe Frederick is in some kind of lost scenario. Like that show, you know? I never watched it. Oh, it's just good until the end. Um, <laughs> okay. let, let's get some pictures up there. Uh, maybe, uh, what is that? That maybe that's maybe that's one of the aliens. What's one of the greys? Fuck! That's the kind of fucking alien. I can't. I know. That's why I put that, picked that picture. Ah, oh, you don't that's like That's the kind. That is the exact what if, kind. What if that, that guy, freaks me out? What if that guy showed up when I was out of town? I mean, Shut up! Why would you say that? No, I'm just wondering. Like, how scared would you be? Why would you put that image in my head? Okay, let's get let's get that one off. Let's God, get, you're let's a get, fucking let's asshole. Get, let's get to the next one. What if that guy ah! showed up? What if that guy showed up? Who would you he pick? He looks hungry. Yeah, he probably want to eat you. You know, he looks more like Hollywood made. Yeah. The other, the other guy was real I crazy. think this next guy's the scariest. Is it you? No. Oh. E.T. E.T. phone home. <laughs> see, I, see, he could show up. You don't know that they're going to be a scary alien. Maybe, maybe. But look Frederick, at that sweet face. I look know. at those good That's pack what I'm muscles. Saying. That's what I'm, <laughs> I'm saying maybe Frederick is out there somewhere, you know, having the, the best life ever. Maybe he's on some other planet. I don't think that Frederick was worried about being abducted and having his best life ever. Well, he wasn't, but that, is, that doesn't mean that didn't happen. Maybe he was taken, and maybe it's awesome somewhere else. I know, it's really Or cold maybe he's in being here. tortured. Maybe he's being tortured every day. Do you know, like, last week it was, like, 70-something in here, and this week it's 69? Probably uh, because probably this next story I'm about to tell. I'm really cold right now. Do you well, feel that? A little bit, yeah. You're, gonna get, you're probably going to get colder with this next story. Oh, great. Well, I don't like aliens, and that story... <sighs> 
I'm just glad that we're not going to your mom's anytime soon. I'm glad we're back. Because that's uh-huh. also, I feel like a lot of um, alien abductions, they don't ever happen in like, I was walking down the street in New York City and then mm. a light beamed down and phew, I was taken. That's never the story. The story is always middle of fucking nowhere. I was by myself. Right. Which kind of does make sense. I mean, if you were, okay, if, you, if, you, if you're going to put a human logic on one of these aliens, if they, you know, exist uh, and do those kind of things, mm-hmm. then, you know, if you're going to some place, you would probably prefer an, un- if you're going to, if you're going to go to take somebody yeah. or spy on somebody, w- why would you go to a heavily populated area where there's much more light in the sky, uh, much more chance of being seen if right. you don't want to be seen? For right. whatever reason. So that makes why sense. That makes sense to me. Why do they want to remain unseen? What's wrong with them? I don't know. Maybe they're not as powerful as some people think. Maybe they maybe, you know, they're worried about uh some kind of counterattack. Who knows? Who knows? That's that's the whole thing about it. That's what's so creepy about them. If you really think it's we don't know. We don't know anything. Are they like vampires? Like the light will melt them? Probably that one that is gonna come to our houses. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready for this next story? Okay. Not particularly, but fine. All right, this is this is the one that got me. Okay. Okay, let's do it. In the, in the late 80s, a shy 10-year-old girl named Becca and her mother moved to an old home in Mount Sterling, Kentucky, at the start of a new school year. The two had been barely scraping by for months. It had been a rough summer. Becca's mom was a grade school teacher who'd lost her job the previous school year due to some countywide budget cutbacks. Her dad was barely in the picture, and her mom was barely able to pay their bills before she lost her job, not getting rich as a single mom school teacher in Kentucky. And then after two months of stressful job searching all over the state at the beginning of the summer, Becca's mom lands a job in Mount Sterling, a little town of about 7,000 people, an old town, going back to the late 1700s. Mount Sterling is a, is a quaint little burg, some would even say beautiful, full of older homes and well-maintained buildings on Main Street, dating back to the beginning of the 19th century, end of the 18th century, many of them, many of them carefully restored, surrounded by rolling farmland. The square, round, historic courthouse constructed in 1796, lined with bricks. Uh, You can imagine horse-drawn carriages, you know, uh, coming around it not that long ago. The town's big claim to fame is its annual court days, where the entire downtown area is taken over by vendors hawking everything from knockoff purses to fried apple pies. Up to 100,000 people attend every year for the four-day October event, and it's been going on every year since 1794. Cool. The house back his mom rented was old, built sometime in the 1800s, located downtown, which made it easy for Becca to walk or ride her bike to all the little small stores and shops back before big box stores put many of these little shops out of business. The house was in rough shape. It had fallen into some serious disrepair long before Becca and her mother moved in. Uh, located on the street line with beautiful, stately old homes, the house looked like something someone forgot to finish tearing down. It didn't fit in with the surrounding homes. It had peeling paint a sagging porch. Even if it were new, there was nothing especially architecturally unique about it for the area. The house didn't have any heating, didn't have any air conditioning. It was sweltering hot in the summer, freezing cold in the winter. Floorboards creaked with every step you took. Loose window panes rattled in the wind. Naked exposed wires were left to poke out from the walls. Insulation littered the floors. There was mice in the walls. Mismatched cabinets with missing fixtures lined a dimly lit kitchen. Only one of the three bathrooms had hot water. The old stone cellar was a maze of dirt floors and stone walls. It had a long, thin stretch of a front porch and a half story on top, just two rooms upstairs, sat right by the road with a little postage stamp front yard. At one point, the house had been used as apartments, so its floor layout was especially unusual. Still had two front doors. When it had been used as apartments, they'd thrown up a few walls here and there for privacy. And now that the house no longer had multiple dwellers, it had a ton of weird doors and odd locations. A bunch of tiny rooms, rooms too small to really be useful. Becca and her mom filled these tiny rooms with boxes of their stuff as they moved in. Becca took one of the upstairs bedrooms for herself, and her mom used the other uh, upstairs room as a guest room. The staircase curved around the entry coming to a peak at a stained glass window at the top of the stairs. To get from one bedroom to the other or to leave, you had to cross the landing and walk in front of that window. On the first floor, there were two large bedrooms, a living room, family room, three bathrooms, a utility room, sitting room, and a large kitchen. There was also several smaller rooms. One of the bedrooms was at the front of the house and the other was at the rear off the kitchen. Becca's mom took the front bedroom on that level. The house had a sizable kitchen, big enough for a large table and chairs with plenty of room left to still move around. All the rooms had doors that could be opened and closed, along with smaller windows up top above the doors that could be opened for air ventilation. 
right? That's the style when mm-hmm. it was built. I'm really getting a, a picture of this place now. It was beyond a fixer upper, more of a let's tear it down and start over type of house. Hmm. But it was available. And more importantly, it was very affordable. So in August, Becca and her mom moved in. Time now for a haunting in Kentucky. The first couple of days were uneventful as Becca and her mom settled in. During those first few days, Becca explored the cellar a bit. The cellar was only accessible by going outside and walking around the side of the house. It was made of stone and had dirt floors. There were these three rooms in the cellar, and the first two were especially dark. These rooms had tiny windows, but the windows were covered with vines and inches of dirt. At the right time of day, the third room received the tiniest bit of light shining through the small cracked glass in the, in the middle of the, of the wall. While exploring these rooms, Becca found a, a strange staircase, a rickety set of stairs that led up from the cellar towards the kitchen, but they didn't lead into the kitchen because the opening had been sealed off. Oh. Creepy. Another odd feature of the house. A few days later, when Becca was unpacking some canned food into one of the kitchen cabinets, she found something else unusual. A small rectangular opening in the middle of the wall with a door on it. What? Inside were two shelves. When Becca leaned forward just a little too hard with her hand on the bottom shelf, it wiggled. When she pressed on it again, she discovered that it could easily slide out. Using a flashlight, she looked behind the shelves and saw the outline of another opening. When she pointed a flashlight down, she saw some rope. <gasps> she called her mother again, and Becca's mom told her she had found an old dumbwaiter. Oh. What had it been used for? Did someone use it to lower food down into the cellar? Had someone been trapped in the cellar? Is that why the stairs had been sealed off? Thinking about it gave young Becca the chills. Two weeks after moving in, a strange visitor stopped by the strange house. Becca heard a knock at the front door in the middle of the afternoon. She opened it to find a young man in glasses. He smiled and asked Becca if her parents were home. Becca thought he might have been a missionary. Becca's mother came to the door and the men said, or the man said, I know this is going to sound strange, but my grandmother lived here when I was a little kid and this is the first time I've been back in years. I was wondering if you'd let me walk around and look at the house. And Becca's mom let him do exactly that. Eek. Becca says, while this may sound like a strange thing to do now, it was a normal thing to do at the time in that area. Becca and her mom started on the first floor, and as the friendly young man moved throughout the rooms, he pointed out things that he remembered about the house, shared stories of his grandmother. Okay, okay. It was an apartment when she lived here. He said, two apartments. She lived on this side over here. He indicated towards the right side of the house where Becca's mother's bedroom was. Becca remembers him having an odd, distant look on his face as though he wasn't really there in the moment. When they got upstairs, he stood quietly in the middle of Becca's bedroom floor and seemed to forget anyone else was there. When they started to leave the room, he paused and glanced back over his shoulder. He looked nervous or maybe scared. He asked Becca, do you sleep in this room? Oh, dear. Not yet, she said. She was still sleeping in her mom's bed because the only uh, because the only had one fan and her room was still too hot at night. Okay. The young man then said, do you ever in this room? I mean, do you ever? And then he didn't finish his sentence. He suddenly looked troubled. Becca's mom thought the tour was over and said goodbye as they walked back towards the front door. Becca followed the young man outside, and once outside, he stopped and asked if he could check out the old cellar. Oh, man. Becca knew she shouldn't follow a strange man down into the cellar alone, but for some reason, she did anyways. Jackass. I always felt that it was kind of spooky down here, he said, when they first walked down and reached the first room. Becca was regretting her decision to lead him down beneath the house. Did her mom even know she was still with him? She felt anxious. Something about him suddenly felt wrong. Where do you live? She asked him. Hmm, west of here, he replied vaguely. And then he walked around, peering into the dark corners and studying the walls as though he was trying to find something. I like playing here in the cellar, he smiled. Oh my God. It was an uncomfortable smile. Made Becca's skin crawl a little bit. He said it's cool and dark. Of course, when I stayed here, there was furniture down here and all these vines were gone. What? Stayed here, she thought. Was he someone who was forced to stay in the cellar? He abruptly turned and faced Becca and asked, You ever get the feeling that someone's watching you? Oh my God. His face was now covered in shadows. What do you mean, Becca asked, as a sick feeling settled into her stomach. Why was she scared of him? He seemed so kind upstairs in the light. Just things, he said, shrugging in the dark. And then Becca and the strange man stood facing each other in the dark cellar for what felt like an hour. He stared at Becca in a way that wasn't menacing but felt terrible just the same. He then let out a thin laugh and said, 
I don't know how I played down here as a kid. And he shivered and asked, you ready to go back out? Becca was more than ready. She nodded and followed him. Weird. Once outside, the man thanked Becca for the tour and said, I just wanted to remember what it was like. Becca asked him, was it a good memory? And after a long pause and another strange stare, he said, some are good, some are bad, and some are just there. You'll understand that someday. What the fuck? And then he walked off across the yard. Becca noticed he didn't head towards a car and that the driveway was empty. Where had the strange man come from? Where was he going? She never saw him again. Holy shit. And Becca never went into the cellar again. (sighs) Smart girl. A few days later, Becca's mother let her have a friend from uh, where they used to live, a girl named Terry, come over and stay for the weekend. And shortly after Terry arrived, Becca came down with flu-like symptoms. After a full day of fever, nausea, dizziness, aches, and pain, suddenly while lying on the couch, Becca felt much better. She felt a sensation of peacefulness wash over her, a feeling of pure relief. And then that peace was destroyed by an ear-splitting shriek coming from Terry. Terry was standing at the side of Becca's bed, looking down at her in horror. Everything about her face was white, from her cheeks to her lips. Her eyes were big, round saucers. A plate was balanced in her hand. She tried to speak. I, I saw, I, I, I thought, I, I, I saw her hand began to shake as she pointed at a spot beside Becca on the couch. There, she said, she was sitting right there on the bed with you, touching you, looking at you. Uh. I walked into the room and she was sitting right there touching you. She, she looked up at me and she disappeared, Terry insisted. I, I know it was her. Just like the pictures you have of her, it was the same person. It was your grandma. Becky's grandmother had died three years earlier. Becca assured her that if it was her grandma, she was only there to protect her. If she'd seen a ghost, she had seen a friendly ghost, a guardian angel. Terry calmed down and fell back asleep. Hours later, Becca woke up feeling rested and fine. Her nausea, aches, and pain, her fever were gone. What was going on? Did Terry really see something? Becca had never talked to anyone who'd seen a ghost before. This was all new to her. A little over a month into her and her mother's stay, Becca still hadn't slept in her bedroom. It was now all fixed up for her to sleep there. The weather had cooled off a bit, but she was still sleeping in her mom's bed. She was also spending less and less time playing in her room. She didn't know why, but she was feeling less and less comfortable in that bedroom. It was stuffy, stifling even. While Terry was visiting and the two were playing in her room, Becca asked her young friend, do you ever feel like someone's watching you in here? Sometimes, Terry shrugged. A girl from the neighborhood, April, had started to come over and play as well, and she asked her the same question. I don't know, April said. I I just don't like being in your room without you, that's for sure. Becca constantly felt like someone was watching her in that room. She'd catch little movements from the corner of her eye and turn to get a better look, only to find that nobody or nothing was there. That's the worst. And then one day, when she was playing in her room, she saw a movement that did not stop when she looked directly at it. Uh Uh-oh. In the corner of her room sat a little rocking chair with a red velvet seat cover. Her dad had reupholstered it for the previous Christmas, and it was her favorite possession. And now, impossibly, it was moving, rocking on its own. Oh. Gently rocking back and forth, steadily, like like it would if she or one of her friends were sitting in it. But there was nothing in the room touching this chair. No one was sitting in it. The air felt still and thick, no breeze at all, and yet the little chair rocked. It stopped and started in spurts. As Becca stood rooted to the ground and watched in horror, the little chair came to an abrupt stop. And worse, after it stopped, the floorboards in front of it creaked as if someone was now getting out of the chair. Get the fuck out of that room. As if someone was about to walk over towards her. Uh -uh, uh Uh-uh, uh-uh. That was enough to send her and her friend both running down the stairs and out the door. Several days later, Becca felt brave enough to return to that room. But not alone. Our friend April came over, the two girls played with some dolls, and then suddenly April screamed. Look, she hissed. (gasps) She gestured gestured wildly with her hands. It was the little red rocking chair. It was moving again, this time rocking faster than before. Uh. It shook as it rocked, as if an angry, frustrated child was pushing it. Neither one of the girls could move. What's going on? Who's doing that? April breathed. I don't know, Becca whispered. The chair usually faced the window, but was rocking so hard, it had now rocked its way almost completely around to face them. Becca felt like whatever was rocking this chair was watching her and April, and then it wanted them to know it was watching them. Oh my God. It was announcing its presence, and its presence was not good. This was not her grandma checking on her when she was sick. This was something else entirely, and whatever it was, it scared Becca. Then, just as soon as it seemed to start, it stopped. Like someone had laid a tender hand on it and steadied it, and when it stopped, Becca and April both bolted out of that room. 
Yeah, get the fuck out of there. Becca didn't, didn't tell her mom about any of this. Oh my God, Becca. She was wise for her years. She'd had a hard childhood. She saw that her mom was struggling to do her best for Becca. She knew her mom could barely afford this house. It had been a really hard summer. At one point, Becca worried that they would have to live with some cousins or be homeless. And now her mom was feeling good about herself, being able to put a roof over Becca's head, and she didn't want to ruin that for her mother. So sweet, but... A few days after the second rocking chair incident, Becca was in the living room alone while her mom was bringing in some things from the car. She was reading a book when she heard a loud noise in the kitchen. She thought it might have been the cat and went in to check. Two of the cabinet doors she knew were closed moments earlier were now standing wide open. And she knew in her bones that some type of ghost, some type of spirit, had opened those doors. She thought about the ghost of her grandma. She decided to try and talk to it. Maybe it was friendly. Hello? She called. Who are you? I'm Becca. Immediately and in unison, both cabinet doors slammed shut. And a sound Becca describes as a low, ominous growl filled the air. Get the fuck out. Becca hurried out of the room and raced to the front door where she nearly collided with her mother. Whatever made that sound was not friendly. But a week later, whatever made that sound may have tried to contact Becca and her mother or at least send them a terrible message. Becca's mom wanted her to sleep upstairs in her own room now, but Becca, of course, is terrified. She was convinced her room was full of ghosts. She didn't want to tell her mom, but she did tell her mom she was scared. So her mom agreed to sleep upstairs with Becca for a few nights to show her that there was nothing to be afraid of. Becca woke up the morning of their first night there, reached down to pull the sheet up over herself that had been tossed off the night and paused in horror. Although the sheet had been clean and stark white when she and her mother had gone to bed, it was now sprinkled with flecks of red. (gasps) It looked like someone had taken a pepper shaker and dusted it with rusty red paint. The entire sheet was covered. Weird. Becca touched the spots. They were dry. She shook her mother awake and said, Mom, what is this? Her mom looked at the sheets, gasped, and asked her daughter if she was okay. She searched Becca's face, hands, and then her arms and legs. Becca said she was fine, asked her mom why she was looking at her all over. And her mom said, because that's blood. And she was right. Some of the spots were bright red. Others were almost black. Old, dried blood stains. Ugh. How did they suddenly end up on this sheet? Fucking Gross. The next night, Becca and her mom carefully looked over another sheet before going to bed, scanned it over, made sure the entire thing was white and clean, no blood spots. And when they woke up the next morning, the sheet again covered with flecks of dried blood. And it happened again for a third night. Becca's mom then agreed to let Becca sleep in her bed downstairs until she could figure out what in God's name was causing these specks. Becca now took some comfort in not being the only person who was unsettled in this new home. Things seemed to get better for a few days, and then suddenly, after feeling fine when she went to bed, Becca woke up to horrible stomach cramps. She was sick again. The worst stomach pain she'd ever felt. It seemed as if she always felt at least a little under the weather in this house. And sometimes, like now, she felt truly horrible. She didn't want to call out to her mom and wake her up, so she silently cried, tried to bite her tongue. When she tried to sit up, spasms raced throughout her body, sent her flying back down to the mattress. The pain was intense. She felt like she was going to pass out. Then clutching her stomach in both hands, she quietly slipped out of bed, tiptoed down the dark hall to the bathroom. She made it inside as fast as she could, trying not to think about what could be watching her from the shadows. She flipped on a light, shut the door, sat on the toilet, And then she heard the house come alive. Uh Uh-oh. She heard whispers coming from below her, what Uh. sounded like footsteps walking above her. Oh, dear. She jumped as one sound came shockingly close to the bathroom door in the darkness outside. She didn't know what was out there. She'd never been so scared in her whole life, but she didn't cry out. She didn't want to add to her mother's worries. At one point, she even heard what sounded like footsteps pacing back and forth just outside the bathroom door. Get the fuck out. As though someone or something was waiting for her to come out. Oh my God. Becca spent almost the entire night in that bathroom. She didn't say anything to her mother the next morning. But then her mom soon heard the house as well. It was cold the night it happened. Becca and her mother sat in the living room with all the doors closed and the heater running. Becca had a blanket covering her lap while she read a book. Her mom was on the other side of the room grading some papers. Suddenly, Becca heard the front door to the house open. She felt some of the cold outdoor air blow inside. Her uncle was supposed to stop by that evening, so she assumed it was him. She then heard what she thought were his footsteps come down the short hallway and then pause outside of the closed living room door. 
Remember, all the doors closed in the various rooms of this house. She looked up with a smile, ready to greet him when he walked in, but he never walked in. Instead, Becca now heard footsteps retreat and move towards the staircase. Then she clearly heard someone walk up the stairs. Then she heard what sounded like someone intentionally walking back and forth, pacing upstairs in her bedroom. A chill ran down her spine, and she looked at her mother. Mom, she said nervously, did you hear that? She was hoping her mother had not heard anything, that it was all in her head. Instead, her mother stands up and tells her her uncle must be messing with them. Becca's mom gets up, walks to the door that separated the living room and the hallway, and opens it quickly, cautiously peering out into the darkness of the hallway. Her mom suddenly seems scared herself and says, Becca, put your shoes on. And when she says that, the sounds of pacing coming from Becca's room abruptly stop. They both look at each other, both clearly afraid. Becca's mother then quietly walks down the hall to the bathroom, flips on the light. They hear a slight creak overhead, as though someone or something is waiting for their next move. Whatever was up there was aware of them, clearly. Let's go, Becca's mom suddenly said urgently as she pointed to the front door, which, by the way, was closed. Becca and her mother both make it outside in a matter of seconds, and then the frightened pair are standing now together outside in the dark sidewalk, standing in the cold, not knowing what else to do. And then Becca's uncle drives up, and they both feel relieved and terrified. Fuck. Now they know he was definitely not the person they had heard walk into their house, open the door, go up into Becca's bedroom, start pacing back and forth. Who did they hear? Who was up there? When Becca's mom told her uncle what had happened, he bravely, or maybe foolishly, runs inside the house. Idiot. He runs upstairs, turning on every light he can, and he finds no one, nothing, no sign of anyone. Becca and her mom saw no one leave the house. They both went back into the house, turned on the rest of the lights, all of the lights, couldn't find a sign of an intruder. Who or what had been running upstairs? Where had they gone? After this incident, nothing unusual happened for weeks, and Becca's mom went from trying to figure out where they should move to, to thinking that maybe they just imagined the whole thing. What? And then Becca saw something far more frightening than a moving rocking chair. Much scarier than the sound of footsteps, she saw something. And that something saw her and spoke to her. <sighs> Becca had made a new friend at school, Scott, a shy, quiet girl named Lori. And Lori didn't know anything about what had gone on in that house over the past few months. And after the house seemed to have calmed down, Becca invited her new friend over for a sleepover. And nothing happened. So later, she invited her over for another sleepover. And nothing happened again. Then the third time she came to spend the night, something crazy happened. The morning after she'd spent the night, Becca's mom was trying to get Becca and Lori quickly out the door because they were going to a basketball game and they were running late. Becca, we need to leave now, Becca's mother called from the front porch. Becca told her mom she'd be there in just a minute and that she'd quickly finished brushing her hair, slipped on her basketball shorts, and left the bathroom. And then as she started walking to the front door from the back of the house, something in one of the bedrooms caught her eye. She turned and saw Lori sitting on the floor crisscross applesauce style, staring straight ahead at the wall, appearing not to notice her. And she immediately got goosebumps. Standing in the doorframe, Becca nervously called out to her friend, Hey, I I I'm ready. Let's go. Lori now turned her head towards Becca. She turned it very, very slowly, her eyes not really looking at Becca, but through her. Chills ran down Becca's spine, and she quickly stepped back away from the room. Something wasn't right. Something really wasn't right. The air in the room had changed and grown chillier, felt thicker. L Lori, mom's waiting, Becca whispered. And Lori didn't react. But was this Lori? It looked like Lori. It was dressed like Lori. But it lacked any of the warmth or friendliness of Lori. It felt like a poor imitation of Lori. And then Lori, or this Lori-like thing, smiled coldly, nodded her head slightly, and remained on the floor and continued to stare at the wall. What the fuck? Becca felt so afraid she started to shake. 
Okay, then I'm going out to the car, she mumbled. And then she started to run through the house, and then this lorry thing started to chase her. Oh, shit. She could hear it, she could feel it behind her. Becca was running down the hall as fast as she could move. She felt the powerful, malevolent energy behind her catching up with her. What would happen if it caught her? She literally jumped out the front door, onto the porch, ran out into the yard. She saw her mom was in the car in the driveway, and Lori ah! was sitting in the back seat. No! No. Becca told no one about what had just happened. What the fuck, Becca? She was afraid her friend would think she was crazy and tell everyone at school. She just sat down wild-eyed beside the real Lori, her heart beating like it was going to leap out of her chest. She didn't leave her mother's side for the next few days inside that house, unless she had to go to the bathroom, and now she was so afraid to get up and use that bathroom by herself at night, she began wetting the bed. Oh, poor baby. Becca didn't have to tell her mom what she'd just seen, though. Soon her mom would be just as afraid of this house as she was. A few mornings later, Becca's teacher noticed a strange bruise on her neck when she showed up at school. She suddenly asked if anyone was hurting Becca. Hurting her? Becca was so confused. She was taken to the school counselor. Her mom, another teacher at the school, also called into the counselor's office. This is fresh, the counselor said. It's still forming, even right now. Becca had woken up that morning with a perfectly shaped handprint across her neck that was now turning into a bruise, as if someone had tried to choke her in the night. Fuck. At this point, Becca told her mom everything, and her mom immediately started looking for a new place to live. But they weren't able to move out that night. And that night was terrifying. That night, as Becca laid awake in the bed on the verge of sleep, she heard something dart across the floor. She opened her eyes, waited to hear it again. Nothing. As soon as she closed her eyes, she heard it once more. This time, the noise moved up all the way to the bed, to her mom's side of the bed, stopped before slowly backing away and fading into the kitchen. And then it repeated that entire sequence again. What was it? It sounded to Becca exactly like a child running slash scooting across the floor in their socks. Very specific. Later that night, Becca heard a banging in the parlor. She poked her mother in the back, trying to wake her up. Mommy, she whispered. Then she heard the banging come again, and she could feel her heart pounding in her chest. Then she heard some woman softly whisper from out in the hall, just outside of their bedroom, just let them sleep. She now went to shake her mom awake, but her mom was wide awake as well. You heard that right, she asked her. Her mother said she did, and the two of them slept with the lights on for the rest of the night. Oh my God. Her mother frantically searched for a new home, but it would take a few days to find it. Meanwhile, over the course of the next few nights, they kept hearing noises. They kept hearing voices. They heard the sounds of someone walking up into the stairs and into Becca's room. Sometimes they heard whispers. Most of the time, they couldn't make out what the whispers were saying, but sometimes it was crystal clear. They heard something whisper, listen, one night in the living room. On another night, a voice commanded everyone, stop it right now, from the foyer. They heard voices giggling, laughing, sighing all throughout the night. They heard a low growling again coming from the kitchen, perhaps coming from down in the cellar. And then, thank God, Becca's mom found a new home. <sighs> and the last few days in that house were the worst. Two nights before moving out, Becca awoke in the middle of the night covered in big, painful welts. Her what? body looked like that of a burn victim. Oh my god. Her mom stayed up and applied a cool cloth and calamine lotion to her body, planned on taking her to the doctor first thing in the morning, but by the time morning came, the welts were gone. The next night, the, next night, the house seemed to literally come alive. First, what seemed like hundreds of cockroaches poured out from the walls. What? They were everywhere on kitchen cabinets and bathroom floors, on their sheets, everywhere. Then they disappeared as quickly as they came and were replaced by wasps. Red insects with fiery stings were suddenly all over the house. Can you just leave us alone? Becca cried out in the kitchen. We're leaving! And her scream was met with a deep, guttural growl from inside one of the walls. Then she and her mother heard the sounds of a rope being pulled. Something metal clanging against wood. It oh was God. the dumbwaiter. What was it bringing up from the cellar? They heard more growling definitely coming from the cellar. What was about to greet them? Becca and her mother left the house and waited in Be Becca's mother's car for the sun to come up. They finished moving out the rest of their things only by daylight. When the last of their boxes was packed up and taken out, Becca stood in the middle of the parlor floor and asked, Why did you do it? What did you want from us? And then she heard the bedroom door, her old bedroom door, upstairs, violently slam shut, and she got the hell out of that house. The slamming of that door was all the answer she was going to get. 
Years later, Becca wrote a book about her experience in that house, and shortly after it was published, someone reached out to her. They had also been haunted in Mount Sterling. After a few email exchanges, it was revealed that they lived in the same house that Becca and her mother had moved out of so many years before. Oh my gosh. This family had also suffered strange illnesses. They'd also heard noises in the upstairs bedroom, family room, and what was described as a terrible growling noise coming from the kitchen and cellar. The growling eventually became so bad they could hear from other parts of the house. Their pets would not enter what was Becca's mother's old bedroom. In Becca's old bedroom, the one with the rocking chair that moved on its own, the air was always unusually cold. Photos taken in this house were full of orbs, with the most intimidating image being a large white vapor arising from the kitchen in several photos, as if it was coming up from the cellar. She wrote Becca saying something evil lives in that house, and Becca didn't disagree. <sighs> Creepy, right? So creepy the 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 doppelganger of the little girl is that's, what freaked me out that's when i came to check i wanted to come check on you in the garage but you didn't check on me i know i didn't I, that's I, so rude i just well then i was like you're being crazy you're being, i almost did i came so close i wish I came, you would have oh my god you should always check on me what if i'm not okay Okay, new rule. Always, always check on you. Always, always check. Always check. Always check. Let's. Uh, to, uh, there is some pictures here. Let's see this first picture, just to show I'm where freezing. this all happened. It is so I know, cold in here. I know that one freaked me out. So let's get this first picture. It I'm has talking gone, about Mount Sterling. It has gone down 0.2 degrees. Okay. God damn it! Oh shoot! Wait a minute. That's not the right photo. That's just uh, the black-eyed children from uh, last week and then from several weeks ago. Why do you keep doing that? Because it scares you so much. Well, now I'm just getting used to it. Hi, kitties. What if they were in the cellar? Oh my god! What was in that cellar? I do not know. Uh, I do have a real picture. This is downtown Mount Sterling. Just like, you know. Crazy. Oh, cute. cute old, Looks you know, like downtown town. Wallace. Oh, yeah. If you know uh -huh. Wallace, uh -huh. Idaho. Yeah, it does. Probably built, I mean, well, later. But yeah, yeah, I get that. Absolutely. And then I couldn't find a picture of their house because no address is given. But this is a historic old home that was probably built around the same time in Mount Sterling. It's beautiful. Yeah. So, I mean, I imagine theirs was a much more beat up, plainer version of that. Right, right. But, you know, lots of little rooms, little front porch there, little yard, uh, imagine a little yard up front. Uh, mm -hmm. I've one, I found one more picture. Uh, I don't know if, like, this was, uh, the. that's uh, the lady you hated from, from last week. That's the demon lady from last week. Whatever. <laughs> okay. Your tricks are old. <laughs> <laughs> They're fun for me. You're stale. Oh, man, stale. Oh, gosh. Okay, got to find some new tricks. But uh, but seriously, creepy story, right? Seriously creepy. Okay, so many things, and that's where you're creepy. I mean... First of all, Becca's so sweet. Like, yes. doesn't want to upset her mom, like mm -hmm. totally gets. And like um, being the child of a single mom for many years, right. you know, it's like, I get it. That stress is real. Like, yeah. you don't want to call your mom when you're sick at school because you know that she can't financially afford to leave work to come get you, right? Like right. those kinds of things are very right. real. And when you grow up in that environment, yeah, I mean, as much as I wanted Becca to get the fuck out of there, I get it. Mm -hmm. You know, like she's really, truly worried about her mom and just can sense that, you know, one oh. more little thing will send her mom over the edge, right? Yeah, how scary to experience all that stuff uh, as a as a little kid. As 10. 10 years old, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, oh man, okay, so many things. Okay, so when you were describing the cellar, what I don't understand is why are there three rooms in the cellar? Yeah. Now, I didn't grow up in a place with cellars. That wasn't like a common thing. This whole house was unusual. It, it, had, been, it had been, you know, modified so many times. I think that was part of what was scary to me. It's just, I mean, it's a very creepy house. They didn't, they didn't know. They don't know why there was extra rooms down there. I mean, there, there, was one, there was one speculation. I will say, I didn't include this in the story. Uh, part of the, they speculated, but, but I mean, the characters in the story were speculating that the house may have been part of the Underground Railroad. Oh, interesting. So That's it, actually very cool. So it could have been slaves staying down there or runaway slaves staying down there. Uh, that part of, you know, that Kentucky was not officially part of the Underground Railroad. Right. But there is debate with historians now that, you know, just because it wasn't officially. Sure. That doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Right. That some people didn't, you know, route through there. That was what they thought. But they couldn't, you know, they couldn't find any historical records or anything. Well, that would make sense then if the dumbwaiter was taking sending food mm -hmm. down to them. But then there was that creepy dude. I know. What was up with that guy? Where did he come from? Where did he? Nobody knows where he came from. And, uh, you know, and then that's the, of course, the imaginative speculation is that, like, what if something really creepy had gone on in that house? And what if well, somebody what was, was kind of forced to live down there? And that was their little kind of room area. What if that guy was talking about the furniture and stuff? Yeah. 
What if he wasn't a guy? What if he was just a spirit that showed up? Well, there's that. Or uh, I mean, yes, I had that thought that like, what if he is just some spirit who's kind of come back to warn them? Yeah. But, he, but he didn't really but he didn't warn, warn them. them. Yeah. Well, kind of. I mean, he said like the memories are good and bad. And some are just there, and soon you'll see. Ugh, yeah. It's like, what does that mean? Because. I don't know. It gives me the chills. I know. I've, I'm so fucking cold right now. Um, I was thinking about, yeah, somebody, I think I've referenced this movie before, but have you ever seen Kiss the Girls? Oh, you have referenced that before. We talked. Yeah, I think I did. Yeah. And there's like an, he's got like an underground layer kind mm-hmm. of thing. That's really intricate. I mean, obviously, right. I mean, it's a movie, but right. it made me think of that. Like, oh, yeah, you could have different people in each of the rooms and like. Yeah. I mean, I guess. I don't know. I, how, and, and there were windows in the cell. That's the thing. When it comes to the cellar, so not just egress, the rooms. Egress why type were windows? there windows in each of the. What cellar have you ever been in with I egress know. windows? Yeah, true. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, maybe at one point they were when times were, you know, this house has been wrong, uh, around for so long. Yeah. Maybe those rooms were kind of like rented out, you know, because it had its own entrance. I mean, nobody wants to live in a cellar, but it's like stranger <sighs> things have happened. I mean, I guess I, I'm I going to lean on know. the Underground Railroad theory just because mm. that gives me a little bit of like, ha. <sighs> yeah. A little yeah. bit of peace. Okay, then the house itself. <sighs> so do you think that that was her grandma when she was sick and then feeling better? I don't, I don't, I mean, the house was so, I mean, maybe, maybe her grandma, like, maybe, you know, like people who, uh, these houses, one theory is there's some kind of like portal where it is. Right. So, so yes, a bunch of bad stuff was there, but maybe her, her grandma, the spirit of her grandma was able to show up there as well. well she I mean, did she did feel, feel better. better. Yeah. yeah. So maybe her grandma was trying to help her in this terrible place. Well, that's, I wonder if like, oh if, gosh, if her knows. grandma was like trying to help her or trying to like get to her to tell her like you guys need to get out of here yeah. or trying to protect them but like they yeah. the evil forces were just so much stronger and more prevalent than sweet little granny right right, right. and then what's up with the bedroom with the rocking chair i know it, it feels like there was a lot of kids in the house like when you were saying um Ugh. like oh just let them sleep and leave them alone and like knock it off that yeah. sounds like a mom that's oh, like yeah, a mom that. yeah. yelling at her kids because becca said it specifically said they had that like shuffling sound of a little kid like right. running around Ew, like coming to check on their mom in the morning or something yeah, yeah. And just sweet but it's like you don't want to hear it if it's a fucking ghost you're really freaked out i keep yeah i that story i keep thinking about the little girl sitting on the floor the doppelganger oh, that is yeah. so weird i've never heard that come up in a story where it's like the apparition takes on the form of somebody else in the house. I mean, I guess, I guess, and I, I must have seen that in horror movies. I'm sure I have. Well, surely you've seen but, it in horror oh, movies. Oh, but man, what was man, that, what was that movie? Creeping me out. What was that Jordan Peele? Oh, Get Out? No, the, the next one. Where oh, it's like the family uh, yes, that looks yes. like the family. Mm-hmm. And there's all the people that are the doppelgangers down. In, uh, yeah, yeah, I can't remember. But yes. Yeah, was it like Us or something? Maybe, maybe, maybe that was the name of it. I can't think of it. Right yeah, it now. had like a it had a name that did not make you think it was I'm sure, a scary I'm sure movie. creeps and peepers know what yeah. we're t- talking Tell about. Us what it we're... is us. You got it. Uh thanks, producer Joe. It's us. It's Good us. Job. Thank you, Joe. Uh Yeek. But the the little kid thing, I really do it just felt like there were a lot of different things going on in there. I don't think that it was just like one. And it also could have been like a family, like a a, a bad father. Yeah. And the mom's yelling right. at the kids, like, knock it off because he's going to fucking... Because there's yeah. something in the house that was definitely yeah. angry. But, like, the little kid didn't feel angry. And the spirit saying, yeah. like, be quiet, knock it off. That didn't feel angry. Whatever was upstairs in Becca's bedroom, that felt fucking terrifying. And the, and whatever was making the um, the the kind of groaning, right. rumble-type noise from the kitchen cellar. Right. That didn't feel good. Maybe they had a dog that they locked down in that cellar. Maybe they had, like, a rabid animal. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't was know. Was there a butcher shower down there? No, not not that came up in the story. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, there was that. That did not. No, that did not show up. I love that. I know what that is. I know. I know from that from the early <laughs> so story. Smart. Oh, what a butcher shower! I'm uh, sure that's going to show up in a lot of horror movies. Yeah, yeah. I just <sighs> that little creepy little Lori. Mm-hmm. Little and the fake, cockroach. Okay, the, the cockroaches and, and the wasps. wasps and the blood flecks. Yeah, what was that all about? What the fuck? What had happened? What had happened in that room? Well, that's the thing. Th- that it was re- repeating itself that way. Right, And how right. did it manifest physically or or did they just see it but it wasn't really there? Like, I wonder if those if somebody else would have seen those flecks. I don't know. I don't know. Well, the other little friend that she had sleep over. She saw the rocking chair. Yeah, so. But I just mean like, like seeing something move compared to like 
physical evidence of blood or something. You know, I wonder. Well, two of them saw it. To right, me, I mean, to right. me, that's better than just one person seeing oh, it. Oh, sure, sure, you sure. Know? So, yeah. Oof. Eek. I can see why you were having a hard time last night. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, well, that was all very fun. Now, now it's your turn to scare me. Let's do some scaring. Now for the my story portion of the show. <laughs> I love it. I pulled a muscle, like, right here, and every time I, like, move my arm, the, oh. it's like a... Yeah, I Deep know that pinching pain. I know that feeling. So if you see me awkwardly like, moving around, that's why. That's why I feel like an old lady. <laughs> <sighs> okay, Are you ready? Do you have I'm, your Do you have your squishy thing? Oh yeah, I got you, my little. I got yeah. Squeezy got, guy. Got my little skull. Skull got squeezy. My little, got my little happy skull. S- skull squeezy. That could be like a rap name. Skull squeezy. Skull squeezy. <laughs> I, in fact, I want you to call me Skull Squeezy. All right. Okay. Okay. Skull Squeezy. Thank you. I don't think that's a good rap name. I don't, I don't think I don't think Skull Squeezy is topping the topping the charts. Listen, no one thought like Wiz Khalifa would be like. It's true. Wiz doesn't have a powerful name, but then yeah, he, he you know he's he's made it his own. I mean Jay Z. Yeah, I guess if yeah. you really think about it. You want to get into it? I mean, nobody thought Vanilla Ice would be the best rapper of all time, and then look at his legacy. <laughs> <laughs> N- nobody thought Ladies Love Cool J would really be a showstopper, and yet yep, here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Okay, friend, we will get cozy. Okay. Okay, dude. Okay, dude. He's been calling me dude a lot lately. <laughs> I don't weird. know why. I'm f- so fucking cold. I want this like. <sighs> get get comfy and tell me to scare me, dude. I know. I just, I pulled my cord. <laughs> dude. Are you ready? I am. Okay. Hey, Lindsay. No one wants to talk to Dan. Fair. Get it. Hey, Lindsay. Here's my personal experience with the Ouija board. Yeah. Uh-huh. All of these events took place in one night when I was about eight years old in a rural area outside Jackson, Missouri. It's always a fucking rural area. (laughs) One night, a group of kids were sitting in the living room, and we had just gotten a Ouija board recently, so we decided to put it to good use. Among the group of kids, I was the youngest. There were six of us ranging ages 14 to 8. We set up the Ouija board and all sat in a circle around it. We all reached in and put one of our hands on the planchet. We began asking questions. It wasn't long before the pointer began moving. We were all laughing and cutting up, accusing each other, you're moving it, no, you're moving it. We were just having fun. We kept moving and asking questions anyways. First, we were introduced to a ghost supposedly from heaven, asking a few questions and getting innocent enough replies. We still all believed that it was totally fake. Soon, the spirit said goodbye and we started asking if there were any more spirits present. It was then that we were introduced to what claimed to be a demon named Uh. Psy. Things got much darker. The replies to our questions became malevolent, and we were skeptical, but we were trying to believe. It wasn't until we asked him for proof that he was really there that we would believe and never forget what happened. Once we asked him for proof, about 10 seconds later, the living room lights shut off and no one was anywhere near a light switch. My mother was down the hall doing laundry. The light in the hall was on and had never gone out before, so we did not lose any power. Also, the breaker box was in a room that was unoccupied, so that wasn't tripped either. After a few seconds, the light came back on and we were all freaked out, but foolishly, we decided to ask for more proof that the demon was real. He then told us to watch the screen. At the time, David Letterman was on, and so we all turned towards the TV. It was then, in the backdrop, in one of the windows of the fake buildings in the fake skyline behind David Letterman, that a ghastly white face appeared in one of them. The face was clearly not human and had a hazy fog around it. Where the eyes were supposed to be was only a blackness with no detail. The face faded away after a second or two, But at that moment, none of us doubted what we were seeing or experiencing. We all immediately moved the pointer to goodbye and sat in the room, silent, looking at one another in disbelief. I don't think that anyone slept that night, and if I remember correctly, we didn't dare ever get the game out again. They say a demon's name gives its power. They say saying a demon's name gives it Mm -hmm. power and tangibility in this world, so I wouldn't go around saying sigh too much love the podcast keep up the good tales regards Corey. wow thanks Corey. that's eek. a eek. that's a yeah that that concept i've thought about that before I, i'm sure i've seen that in movies where like somebody is watching the tv show and then the character in the tv show i know i have actually but like you know i can't think which one turns and like speaks directly to the person or they see but that is such a creepy concept to me i mean can you imagine i 
I know this isn't the story, but, I, but suddenly I just think like if you're like alone watching TV and all of a sudden one of the characters clearly stops in the scene, just looks right at you and is like, hey, Lindsay. But that's not what I, happened. I know. I know. But it made me think of that. It made me think. But even just like that. Like but why little, are you making it worse for me? I don't know. It's so fucked up, man. <laughs> Dude. But uh, no, but I just think like like those kids, I mean, especially they all saw it like a little face in that's the background. That's the thing is that yeah. when, when more than one person sees it, that it, I think. It, it does give it more credence. It does. Because mm-hmm. then you you can't justify it away like oh it's just my imagination. I mean there there definitely is the power of suggestion you know if one person says it first and other people like it along but more weight for sure yeah much more likely uh, yeah no those ones absolutely also creep me out uh, more dude yeah dude <laughs> thanks bro thanks for being here you're a great addition to this show bro thanks bro you're welcome my man <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're so weird. Okay, ready? Yes. Hi there. First, I just wanted to express how much I enjoy both the Time Suck podcast as well as Scared to Death. My husband got me started on Time Suck, and now I listen to it on a regular basis. Thank you. To Scared to Death, uh, the Scared to Death podcast is much more my style, and I find myself (laughs) wanting more information and longer episodes because why not? I get it. I'm writing now to tell you my most vivid encounter and memorable memorable experience. Sorry for the long email, but the details of the story are important. About five years ago or so, my husband and our daughter, who was two or three at the time, and our basset hound and myself lived in an upstairs apartment. We ended up living there for a few years, so these experiences did not sway us to move out. Nonetheless, it was scary as hell. Our daughter had her own room, and we had a room directly next to hers. Then down the hall was the living room. At the end of the hall, the kitchen just off the living room. On several occasions, we would put our daughter to bed and would be sitting in the living room watching TV when out of nowhere, our daughter would come running full speed out of her room, screaming bloody murder. Nothing was ever seen in her room by either of us, but she would tell us the man in the closet isn't nice and doesn't want me to play with the little boy. Still gives me chills just thinking about it. Man in the closet. Never fun. No. We didn't think much of it at first. Oh, she's just seeing shadows or something. Then it started happening during the day. She'd be playing in her room, me in the kitchen cooking or in the living room with my husband, and she could be back there for hours and hours. And then all of a sudden, here she comes running fast as her little feet would carry her, crying hysterically and screaming. And she would say the same thing. The man in the closet is mean and doesn't want me to play with the little boy. When we would ask her... Wow, and, and who's the little boy? No, okay, okay. Man, they don't, they don't oh have a God. son. Yeah, so it's right, just right, mom, just, dad, little ugh. girl, doggy. When we would ask her what this man looked like, she would say he was tall like daddy, who's 6'3", with a long black coat and a black hat. Well, what about the little boy, we would ask. He just looks like a little boy. He shows up in my closet to play with my toys and me. He is very nice, and he is my friend. Oh, my God. These experiences did not stop the entire time we lived in this apartment. Our dog, was, our dog would randomly stare at walls and corners and just bark and bare his teeth at nothing. Ah. Uh. The string to the light in my closet would randomly start swinging rapidly in my closet with no wind or anyone around. I was standing in my kitchen one day and saw a black shadow in the entryway to the kitchen out of the corner of my eye. I thought it was my dog. I looked over and nothing was there. It was like a mist that moved past the entryway when I looked. I checked around for my dog and he was asleep in the back of the house in his bed. No possible way that it was him. Mm. There was a family we knew that lived downstairs across the complex from us, but we knew them and conversed on a regular basis. They ended up moving into a different apartment just downstairs from us because they both physically saw a large, dark figure of a man next to him. I'm sorry. They both saw a large, dark figure of a man in a black hat and coat with a hand on a small child standing next to him. After they moved to the other apartment, they had a friend take a picture of them in the yard in front of their apartment. They sent the picture to some family in Australia because that's where they're from. Okay. And the family called them almost instantly and started asking about the other child in the photo that is seen behind them standing on the couch peering out the front window at them taking the picture. God. We never did figure out who the man or the child was or why they seemed to be hanging around the apartment complex the way they did. Either way, it was terrifying. I love the Scared to Death podcast and I hope things get better for Lindsay. I'm doing okay. Yeah. I'm doing okay this week. I know how exhausting it can be to have things like this haunting your thoughts and dreams. 
by the way, when she was talking about people having something like nine chakras in the body and Dan piped in and said, well, I have 40. I nearly spit my drink all over my computer at work. Oh my God, I was dying laughing. I'm sure people in my office think I'm absolutely insane. <laughs> Laugh out loud. Thanks for all you do. Sincerely, Megan. Thanks, Megan. I know that was a nice light ending. That was, that was. Oh man, it's like, yeah, so many things were creepy. It's creepy that the, the, the little kid, I mean, I get like the imaginary friend, but then having like a friend that other people have seen this same kid that that kid didn't know about when he starts talking about it. Right. And then also like, I'm getting the chills, like, like, but like also like the, the guy telling her not to play with this kid. Like, what is that about? Right. Is the kid the problem? Is the guy the problem? And then, and then what fucks with your head about, or like my head, a lot of these stories is that you never get any answers. No answers. They're just mysteries. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you can, it's not like you can catch this shadow dude and be like, Hey buddy, what are you doing here? We need to know. You're going to get, we're going to kick you out of this apartment place if you don't tell us what your demon doings are. You know, it's like they get- <laughs> Your demon doings. They just get to be whatever they are. Knock it off with your demon doings. Enough, enough demon doings. Don't let me, I'll stick my 40 chakras on you. <laughs> I'll fucking do a power shot. I'll do a Hadouken power chakra move on you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll blow your crystals up. I'll blow your whatever. <laughs> maybe you have some kind of demon crystals that the good crystals protect us from. Oh my God. Did you have an imaginary friend as a kid? Uh, No, actually I never did. Did you? Yep. You did? Yeah. She of course, went, of course she, she went, did. <laughs> of course I did. She went everywhere with me. I loved her. <laughs> oh, I think dude. her name was Brittany. But like, I, I think that it was like very normal and I wanted yeah. her to like sit next to me. I, wa I think there was a phase where she had to have a place setting at the dinner table. Oh God. But I don't, I should ask my mom. I don't think it ever got creepy. I think it was just typical kid stuff. But I don't know. My mom also is a big scaredy cat. So like she's mm -hmm. coming to visit us this week and oh, she, man. well, she already said, she's like, I'm not fucking coming to that studio. Like, ah, she is yeah. not interested in watching us do this. Whereas like my dad was here a couple months ago and he, he's more open to it. And both oh, of my parents right. are religious. Yeah. And so I don't know, I don't know if my mom is just a scaredy cat or if it's the religious aspect. My dad, didn't he have some sort of story about something that happened to him? Yes, he did. And I cannot recall the details of it now, but yes, he did. Yes, he no. did. Next time he's in town, we'll have him on. Did you think it would be fun? Uh, your mom would think it was funny if uh, while she's asleep in the guest room, if I came in in the middle of the night and just, it just got right closer with my face. Just, do, do you need anything? <laughs> <laughs> Are you enjoying your stay? <laughs> I would like it better if you found a way to do that without going there, in there. Like if you could like Ooh. quickly have a speaker installed. Oh my God. Like like in the, in the oh my God. Can you imagine do that to somebody in the guest room? Yes. In the, in the uh, head of the bed, the header, whatever it's called, where the mattress ends by the wall. <laughs> the head, the front, the, the top, the, the top of the bed. I just want to watch you struggle. This is so <laughs> I never great. Know, I never know these terms. If you could have like a little, the header, the header. Yep. If you could have a little, the head of the bed. You have the head of the bed and the foot of the bed. Okay, if you could, the, near the head chakra of the bed, <laughs> if you could have a little speaker put in. Yeah. But then, yeah. But if you could, like, from some place, other place in the house. Oh my God! Just like whisper things. Like, are you enjoying your stay? Let's find a way to fuck with Kyler. He stays up late now. <laughs> now that he's a little Kyler. bit older, he gets to stay up late, right? Oh, Especially on the weekends. Like he oh, can boy. stay up till midnight. Oh, I'm not. I have one. Oh, oh cool. Another I, one. I didn't well, know you had three. It's a tiny, sweet one. Okay. And I, I thought that it was a good Great. way to exit the show this week. Okay, cool. Okay. Dear King and Queen of the Suck, I've tried to spread the suck to my wife with limited success. However, <laughs> she has gone all in on scared to death. Yay. Good. Thanks. Our five-year-old daughter told my wife that this year she wanted to go as a demon for Halloween. As I am minding my own business watching YouTube videos in my room, Tessa comes in with the attached picture that she has drawn. She tells me that she sees this, this every night in her room. Oh. And I reply, where? And she says, in my room. I take her in her room and ask her, where does she see it? She proceeds to demonstrate how she sees it from her bed as it walks out of her closet. Now I'm skeptical, but she usually comes into our room in the middle of the night to sleep for the rest of the night. And I say, well, that's really something. We should tell mom about it. And she quickly says, no, we can't tell mom. We can't talk about the demon. What? I agree to secrecy. And the first chance I get, I go straight to my wife, as all good parents do, and ask her about the picture of the demon Tessa drew. And <laughs> I say to her, or she says to me, the picture of her teacher? No, the demon. No, the one of the cuphead and the mug man? No, the demon. <laughs> I look deep into her eyes and with every ounce of sincerity I can muster, I ask, are you fucking with me? And then she collapses with laughter. She had seen Tessa drawing a picture of a demon in her, uh, of her demon costume and told her to tell me <laughs> that she had seen this creature in her room. That is great. Joe, you want to pop it up on the screen? 
And and this picture scared me this morning. <laughs> so, and, and who wrote, who sent that in? Uh, that is from our friend Ryan. Oh, Ryan, thank you. Well, Ryan, you actually did scare me because when I put the stories together, I the images for the YouTube version, I put them in a Dropbox folder and then producer Joe, he takes them and, you know, adds them to a little slideshow thing. And I, I, I've never seen anybody else put a picture there. So I'm putting pictures in there this morning and all of a sudden there's a picture, like I see, uh, you know, too many images, little, little thumbnails. I'm like, oh, what yeah. the hell? And pull that open. I'm like, how the hell did this get in my Dropbox? I thought it, like it just showed up on its own. It that freaked me out. so great. Yeah, I was cracking up so hard in this story last night. I love it. I love <laughs> so him funny. messed with. Oh yeah. That's great. I love that, his, that the daughter is a part yeah, of yeah, it. Yeah, in on the joke. Oh yeah. Oh, I, lo- I love it when kids get in on a joke. Actually, that reminds me. I want to share that real quick as yeah. we leave here with Kyler. Uh, Lindsay and I and the, and the kids, uh, you know, Kyler Monroe, we went down to where I grew up for Thanksgiving and went down to <laughs> <laughs> went down to, uh, to, to Riggins, Idaho. Uh, my mom, you know, White Bird is where she's at. So we, we were staying in both places. But anyway, right before we head back up to Coeur d'Alene, we decide to go to this Salmon River Inn place. And I, I don't I don't even know if that's what it's called it's now. Not. It, it's not. There used to be a place called uh, Salmon River Inn, uh, and I think that's maybe actually still is, but it's a different menu. Anyway, the Salmon River Inn, when I was a kid, had a very specific menu, and this other place has that menu and now uses it. For and their, there was a very specific sandwich that Dan wanted. Very specific sandwich that I wanted, and it was uh, delicious, by the way, the back eddy. And, but we go there, and it's kind of set up like the old Salmon River Inn used to be with the video games and the jukebox and the pool tables. And just like my youth, uh, everything there is a piece of shit and falling apart. And it's like sketchy. And so you're constantly. Everything's breaking. Everything's breaking. It's eating all of our quarters. Video games take the kids. Kids are constantly like, you know, taking our quarters, all this. The only thing that worked was the the bubble gum machine. The bubble gum machine. The bro got $4.50 worth of bubble gum. (laughs) (laughs) And so I'm trying to get the jukebox to work so we at least have some tunes. Won't take my credit card. Won't take my other credit card. Won't take the $5 bills. I'm just like, just on a whim, I'm like, I throw a 20 in there and it takes it. I'm like, oh, great. (laughs) See, like 72 credits. 75 credits. 75 credits. I play two and the machine, the whole area, all the video games, the coffee machine, everything crashed. It blows a circuit because we're not used to people using all this at the same time. It's like, it's very rinky dink. I love it. Go, I go, we know my mom, I don't even care. I'm like, whatever. I'm just used to this stuff, taking my money. My oh, mom, no. my mom Your tries not having it. To, to the owner and the owner is very rude and dismissive. This is all sets up how I justified this in my mind. So kind of rude to us. Takes 10 minutes to get the machine going uh, back up. I assume it's not going to have my credits anymore. Well, it does. It starts playing uh, Doobie Brothers. Actually, it was with the song. Uh, <laughs> um, While well, it comes back up, and then I get an idea. But we're almost ready to leave now. It's taken so long for it to get going. And we have all these credits. So with my son, Kyler, I'm like, hey, let's play the same song over and over and over and over. Because they would have to shut the machine off, essentially, to get it to stop or, or pay to have extra credits. So we picked uh, Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up. <laughs> and it started the first – it literally, um, I think, between 25 and 30 times in a row was going to play, which we determined was at least 90 minutes. <laughs> 90 minutes to two hours. Never gonna give you up. Like whatever. Never gonna let you down. Yeah. Never gonna let you down. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, we're just getting rickrolled over and something, over. Something, something. Dessert. Dessert. Oh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. We don't even know the words. But I love melody. that song. I, I just, I just love thinking that somebody there after we left and the people running it, they had to listen to that song <laughs> over and over. Oh so yeah, Kyler. It just reminded me of like kids being in on a joke. Kyler thought it was so oh, fun, God. and him and I laughed about it on the ride home for for hours. Yeah, Kyler would be like, "Hey, Dad, do you see what time it is?" <laughs> They're probably still They're listening. They're still listening. They're still listening. <laughs> <laughs> and, so funny. And thank you uh, all for listening uh, week after week. Listening today. It's fun. It's uh, 13 weeks now. 13 12, weeks. 12, actually. 12. 13 episodes. Oh, th- that's right. Yeah. That's right. Because yeah. we did two on the first week. Yeah. So, so really almost th- almost basically three months. Almost three months. That's crazy. And yeah, it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm having more and more fun. I hope you're having more and more fun. I mean, I'm doing okay. But like, you know, I think yeah. it's really a week to week basis. I mean, I <laughs> yeah. think that I think Heather taking over the My Story emails. Right. It's funny. I figured out like I also cannot read the My Story emails at home. Okay. I okay. have to do it in the studio. Okay. Like I have a like, contained space. That's good. I can somehow like mentally put it in the work yeah, box and leave it and yeah. like go home. But, you know, I also haven't had to be alone in several weeks. And right. That we're, helps. We're going to be together for many more weeks before I'm going to have a week alone. Okay. So that's good. That's good. 
And uh, yeah, so, so keep listening. Keep sending your stories to my story at scared to death podcast.com. Send in anything else to info at scared to death podcast.com. Uh, thanks for subscribing on YouTube. Thanks for the ratings and reviews for following us on Instagram and Facebook at scared to death podcast. And yeah, uh, th- big thanks to the, to the team here, the bad magic production team, harmony Bella camp on social media, Joe Paisley producing, directing Z- Zach Flannery for being part of the production team as well. Thanks to Joe Paisley, Zach Cohen, Jeffrey Montoya for the sound beds, and thanks to Heather Rylander for uh, taking over the My Story at Scared to Death Podcast.com emails. So enjoy your nightmares, creeps, and peepers. Uh, watch out for fake little girls. <sighs> Hope you were scared to death. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within scared to death.